Dr. Theo Bernstein as our speaker today. today. Um, Dr. Bernstein is a distinguished scientist at Microsoft Research. Uh, he has published more than 150 papers and uh, two textbooks, two books, uh, all related to database systems. Um, he is a world-class expert on many different topics, especially uh, database transaction processing. Uh, uh, he has a long list of awards, uh, to name a few, he's an ACM fellow, a, a recipient of the ACM Sigma the Cod Innovation Award. Uh, one thing I want to mention is uh, Dr. Bernstein has a very, ripe, high, very high reputation for his very uh, uh, constructive uh, professional uh, comments when he reviews uh, conference papers. Uh, especially, I noticed that when I was uh, chair for some conference. Uh, another thing I want to mention is uh, uh, Dr. Bernstein also influences some, some of our own work at the UCI. Uh, for example, my team has been building an open source system called the Texera to do a parallel uh, data analytics. And our decision of choosing the ACT model was partially based on the conversation I had with Dr. Bernstein a few years ago. So without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Bernstein. Great, thank you, Chen, for the very nice introduction. Um, so I'm here to give you a retrospective on a project that I, I spent um, many years on and called um, Orleans. And I'm gonna start though with a, uh, oops, my slides are not, there we go. Um, I'm gonna start with a kind of a meta discussion about um, database research um, in the systems area and just how I go about doing it and how I th what I think is really driving the agenda since I understand not the entire audience here is our database people. Um, so what do you do? Well, you wanna identify obviously a challenging research problem that's related to databases, which generally means storage indexing, queries and updates over large persistent shared data. Then you gotta come up with a novel solution, of course. Um, got to show that it works, have experiments that proves where it really works and ideally show where it doesn't, although not everybody is so diligent about that. Um, but it's, oh. And then finally have a success story where it actually made a difference to somebody somewhere. Um, so where do these problems come from? And I claim there's actually a, a short list that covers the gamut. This is for systems problems now. There are many database problems that are not related to systems. They're more user oriented, but at the systems level, one thing that drives the agenda is hardware mechanisms. Every time a new hardware mechanism comes along, often not targeted for databases in particular, um, you know, we all look at it and say, gee, that looks like something that we could make use of somehow. We should figure out how best to use it. Multi-core vector processing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Second is that a new software mechanism has shown up. Um, again, not necessarily targeting databases, but um, you know, we start looking and seeing how we might leverage that mechanism to solve some well-known problems in databases. So distributed hash table, machine learning, blockchain, log structured storage, and so on. Um, third source of problems is a new systems platform which is not just a mechanism, but just a whole way of organizing computing. So cloud computing is an obvious example, or specifically cloud storage, very large main memories. Now people are talking about cloud fog edge, where you some in-network processing in addition to the cloud processors and the edge processors. Um, each of those is a cause <laughs> to rethink some of your solutions for data management. Then there's the possibility of a new workload, a new usage scenario. You know, you're gonna train ML models or you have graph algorithms over big data for knowledge bases or data science. So that's another, another source of problems. And then finally, um, you optimize for a new metric. You know, maybe instead of um, latency or throughput, which are the usual ones for performance, maybe scalability, scaling out or, or um, minimizing cost, um, best you within, um, within some performance envelope and so on. Um, so the interesting thing about this list is I think it's complete. I think that um, pretty much every systems oriented database research that you find will be motivated by one or more of these bullets. 
Um, and it's also kind of useful for grad students and, and others just to try to think about what it is they're trying to accomplish. Um, now, the, um, obviously, in order to make it research, um, you got to claim novelty. Um, and unfortunately, there's not much new in the world. Back when I started doing research in, um, in the 70s, um, there was a lot of low-hanging fruit, you know, so many problems that nobody had ever even thought of before. Um, and, and so it, it, there was plenty of opportunity to innovate. It's not so easy. And now very often when you look at solutions to database systems problems, um, you find people are, are repackaging um, versions of um, salute techniques like the ones listed here uh, in a different combination in a different way on a different hardware platform using a different um, computing platform, et cetera, et cetera. But it's, it's, um, it's coming up with a genuinely new technique is rare. And it's really where, I mean, that these days, that's the kind of thing that wins Turing awards, you know, as you come up with a, a really different way of solving, it does happen periodically, you know, you see blockchain show up or, or um, consistent hashing or, um, you know, um, enclaves in, in hardware for, for, um, um, for highly secure com computing and so on. So they do appear from time to time, um, but um, they're not a dime a dozen. Now I work in an industrial research environment. I, I used to be a professor for some years, and, but I've been in industry now for um, more, than, more than 30 years. And, and in industry, the, um, the time horizon tends to be shorter than in academia. Um, more like say five years, you know, sometimes we work even shorter, just a little bit ahead of a product group. But um, when we see problems that we think are more than, you know, more like 10 years out, we say, that's a, that's a great thing for a university to work on, but nobody can predict where the business is gonna be in 10 years. So we try to work a little closer in. Um, you want there to be a big opportunity for revenue or cost saving. That doesn't mean you're gonna succeed. But if you can't even tell a good story as to why the company ought to be interested in the work you're doing, then it's unclear why it should be paid for by the company. And again, not just something that's, um, um, you know, that, that's, that's, that's more academic. Um, and our goal here is to de-risk the solution. I mean, it's often, the, the, the engineers building stuff are just as smart as we are, but, um, the thing they don't have is time. I mean, they've got to be working on something that's going to ship in the next year or so. Um, and if they can't put the work on a schedule because they don't know how long it's going to take, then um, then it's really hard for them. And so um, de-risking the solution is a big deal, producing a prototype that shows that it actually can be built and they can visualize how long it's going to take to do it. Um, Ideally, you get the product group involved early on because impact is important. And if they're invested early, the more likely that they'll be interested in using it. And then finally, since we're a research lab, um, Microsoft Research, we want to publish it both for public rec recognition, but also kind of to prove that it was research um, and not something that the product guys should have done. And, and it was you know, you know, not really research. Um, so that's where I'm coming from in all of it in all of this. And so in some sense, the work that I'm gonna be talking about for the rest of, um, the rest of this seminar about, about Orleans is really a case study in, in, um, in a, a particular data point in this, in this um, model, if you will, of, of database research in the industrial sector. So the research problem that um, we chose was how to add database features to a cloud programming framework. Um, which is which is Orleans, and um, first question is why is it research? Um, people have added. I mean, every programming language has some ability to do database management. What makes this one research? Um, well, the first is that um, we're doing it on the cloud computing platform, in particular with cloud storage, and cloud storage has very different characteristics than a disk attached to your server where you're running um, your program. Um, secondly, is that um, we're running a different workload. We're doing state, we, stateful cloud services, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. 
Um, and finally, um, the metrics here are, are in addition to good performance, it has to scale out because we're going to run on large numbers of servers. It's got to be robust. It's got to be something that um, if the workload changes a little bit or the platform changes a little bit, you know, failures, it still works fine. Um, and, and finally, programmability, ease of use was a big deal in um, the development of Orleans um, for the you know, ease of use for, for the developers. So um, let's move forward and see how, what, what the problem is in a little more detail and how we went about solving it. So the, the, um, I said that um, we're interested in stateful um, application services. So the service has to be maintaining some kind of state information, um, internet of things, games, social networking, mobile applications, telemetry, just by the, just by the description of the, of, the, of the application type, you can easily imagine that there's a lot of state information that has to be maintained in order to offer the service. Um, and, and so that's the style of it, that's the style of application. Um, and I probably should stop here and just say that from now on, I mean, if you wanna interrupt with questions, I'm, I'm all for, you know, raise, raise your hand, speak up. I, you might have your mic disabled, so you probably have to raise your hand in order to speak and one of us will, will, um, will turn on your mic for you. Sure, so one, one protocol we can follow is if you have questions, you can raise your hand uh, or you can type in your question in the chat window and I'm going to monitor both. Okay, great, great. Happy to make this interactive. So um, that's the style of application. And if you look at that list, that's like a, that is a large fraction of the new applications that are being developed these days. Um, not, um, it cover, covers quite a wide gamut. Um, in all of these applications that I just listed, application state is usually represented as objects. And the reason is that in all these cases, um, the state information is usually the state of some object in the real world. Um, you know, the state of a device or the state of a game or the, you know, the state of a, of a, um, of a mobile device, um, et cetera. So um, it's, these are naturally object oriented applications. Um, in a game, you might have, you can have players, games, grid positions, lobbies, player profiles, leaderboards. Um, money, in-game money, weapons, caches, if it's that kind of game. Um, so, you know, you can easily see that there's a lot of different kinds of, of objects um, that are being maintained as state. And so it's really natural to implement these, these applications as in an object-oriented way. Um, in, the, in the IoT area, for example, where you've got a lot of sensors and, you know, out there devices, um, it's clear the things, I mean, the Internet of Things. It's the things, and so those things are objects. And there's a a, a, tech, a, um, a modeling technique um, called digital twins, which has become quite popular. Where you have objects running in the cloud, they're called twins, which are basically surrogates for the object out there in the physical world. So you've got a thermometer hooked up to a server somewhere. And then you've got its digital twin, which is an object running in the cloud. Um, and their entire systems built around this to make those digital twin models um, available to application developers. Um, the applications themselves have a number of interesting properties. First of all, they manage millions of objects, um, streams, images, videos, knowledge graphs. Um, there's lots and lots of them. Um, secondly, is the objects are active for quite a while. Um, this is not where you just spin up an object and then have it disappear quickly. Usually they're, they're active at least for minutes. You, know, you log in to play a game and maybe they're playing the game for 20 minutes and all those objects um, are around for, um, for that period. Um, and, and sometimes um, they're basically, as long as the application is up and running, you expect the objects to be active, for example digital twins in an IoT application. Um, the application does heavy computation. Um, some of it's lightweight interactive stuff, but, but some of it is really quite heavy. You do complex actions. Maybe you're rendering images, you're running um, heavyweight queries over high-speed streams of data flowing in from, 
from the outside world. Maybe you're running computations over graphs or, or you know, searching um, knowledge graph in response to a, um, an interaction with, with, a, with, an end, um, um, with a communication endpoint, a user or some, some other device. And finally, there's heavy communication. There's messages between objects um, at a pretty high rate. There's also a high bandwidth message stream. So um, this, this need for lots of, comp lots of objects, lots of computation and lots of communication um, leads to a um, implementation structure where the, um, the system is split up into tiers where um, you have storage, um, you've got a middle tier of comp compute and you've got a front end um, communications. And this enables you to scale out each of these functions independently. So, um, you know, whereas you know, people build database systems often with um, server attached storage and stored procedures, and it's all wrapped up in one box. You know, you, you have the computation to run the query, the, the storage connected to that box. Um, but in this environment, you really want to be able to scale this stuff out independently. And so generally the storage is not co-located on the machines where the computation is done. And then similarly, all the front end chattiness with, with the outside world is generally done on front end servers like you know, web servers and the like. Um, these sorts of applications are often implemented these days with what's called an actor system. Um, and the reason why people like actors is that um, the programming model of actors simplifies distributed programming in this multi-tier architecture. So what's an actor? Well, it's simply an object. So why, why even give it another name? Well, it's, it's, got a, it's an object, but it has a couple of extra properties. Um, first of all, the, um, the actors communicate only using um, message passing. There's no shared memory between them. And, you know, and this is, again, it, it's, it's natural. If you think about the objects and the applications that I'm, des that I'm describing, they can't share memory. Um, they're running on different machines. They're, they're accessing remote storage. It's, um, you can't count on them being co-located so that they could share memory. So it's best to just assume they can't share memory. Um, and the, um, the actors, um, each actor is also single threaded. It runs one, it processes one message at a time, um, does the work and then returns to its caller. So there's no multi-threaded execution inside of an actor. Now on today's multiprocessors, this sounds like a terrible idea um, because you know, you've got all this parallelism in the compute uh, framework, you expect multi-threading in order to benefit from it. But, but um, it's, it, for an application developer, um, it's very hard. You know, first of all, you've got multi-threads, they're running inside the same process, they're sharing the state of the, um, um, the process, um, they trip over each other, one updates, the other one reads. This stuff is hard, and for those of you who've done multi-threaded programming, you know it's difficult, and this is um, really supposed to be an easy to use programming environment for applications. Um, Plus the actors are these fine grained objects out there in the world. So it's not clear you even need multiple threads running inside the actor. The rate at which they're processing messages is not so high that it can't be handled by a single thread. So the assumption is that the actors are pretty fine grained and, and therefore it's fine to just have them execute. Um, each actor executes on a single thread. Um, there are many, um, programming environments for actors. I, they were listed actually on the last page. I should probably have said something about that on the right. There's Erlang, which is probably the most well-known of these. It's the oldest. There's a system called ACO, which is basically the Erlang programming model implemented in Java um, and Orleans, which is the system, the system that I, I work on. Um, Orleans is an open source um, cross-platform framework for um, actors building uh, robust app distributed applications on the Microsoft platform on .NET. Um, it's been open source um, since 2014, I think. Um, and um, it's pretty widely used um, outside Microsoft is very widely used inside Microsoft. Um, so many of the Microsoft services that, um, that you know about, um, a lot of the games on, on Xbox, um, Teams, 
um, Skype uh, fraud detection service for our application suite, Office, and our IoT um, framework. They all they all have major subsystems that are built on top of Orleans. And um, for anybody who's been involved in the Orleans, um, those of you at, at UCI have been doing it, you know from just watching the chat rooms, there are people all over the world that are active at any given time who are working on this. Um, the, the big thing about Orleans is that it, it invented the uh, virtual actor model. Um, and this, was, this was a new thing that the, the idea is that each object has a primary key um, objects are loaded on demand. So um, what that means is you don't, you don't use the new operator to create a new instance of an object. All you do is you just reference the object based on its key. And if the object is, is running, then it's invoked. Um, if the object is not running, it's loaded and activated on demand. Basically the system will, will um, it, it will it will pick a um, server that's um, lightly loaded. It will it will um, load the object, load its state. Um, it'll run its its constructor um, and um, and thereby make it available. And it'll remember where it put the object, and the object will stay there for for a while. As long as it's being used, it will stay there. It'll only be deactivated after an idle period. So. Generally, um, the application developer does not um, preload the object or doesn't try to deactivate it manually. You, you just let the underlying runtime do this, do this for you. Um, and, and for scalability, load, Orleans will load balance the objects across servers. Usually what it does is it's just round robin. Each, each object that's created goes to a different server, but, but there are other load balancing techniques that are built into the system and can be, can be used instead. Um, that um, the application, if you look at it, is just plain old C-sharp. It, it supports F-sharp, which is the functional um, language um, for .NET. Um, and and people um, people have used um, JavaScript. I mean, there there are other other um, language integrations, but most people write their Orleans applications in C sharp. Um, it runs on it runs on Windows. It runs on Linux. Um, it's um, it's portable. So how did I get involved? So this is maybe a little bit. This is sort of another little industrial research story, and this is in a retrospective. So worth kind of explaining how this all came about. So the, the project was created around 2008 um, um, to address the issue of um, cloud programming, make cloud application development easier. And in three years later, I was I moved into a group, into a lab which in which the Orleans project was, was active, it had been running for a few years. And the, the managers were not really too sure what this Orleans thing was. And and um, asked they wanted somebody who'd been around for a while to go take a look at it and see what they thought of the whole project and um, whether it um, it was an important one and or something that um, maybe should be um, ramped down. I looked at it and I said, "Oh, I get it. This is transactional middleware. I've seen pro I've seen programming frameworks like this before, um, and yeah, it looks really useful." It's pretty interesting, though, that it doesn't have transactions. It's this interactive environment, you know, like you see for uh, what used to be um, enterprise Java beans or J2EE, or before that, um, transaction processing monitors like CICS. Or yeah, I mean, it's it's another way of writing distributed applications, make it easy to do. Um, but in spite of the fact that it didn't actually support transactions, I was surprised that the users. Um, really liked it. You know, the, the, the folks in the um, Xbox game division um, really loved it as, an, as a way of, of getting um, more, um, more applications to run. Yeah, Chen, got a question? Yeah, I mean, before you were asked to evaluate Orleans, how did uh, Orleans get started inside of Microsoft? Um, so Jim Laris, um, who many of you know is a Pretty well-known um, 
computer scientist, researcher. He's currently Dean of Computer Science at EPFL. At the time he was, um, he was in Microsoft Research and he had this idea that it would be a good idea to um, come up with a programming system that would make it easy to develop applications for the cloud. Um, and he hired um, a senior engineer, Sergey Baikov, and the two of them went off and, and started conceptualizing what this was. And I guess it took them about a year or more and they settled in on the actor model as being a good way of simplifying the programming, um, the programming model to do this and, um, you know, and then slowly ramped up the project from there. Um, the project was about, was, was nearly three years old when the first, um, maybe two and a half years old when the first internal um, users appeared on the scene from Xbox. I mean, they, they had been advertising it. You know, we have these, we have these um, internal um, trade, um, trade shows essentially um, at Microsoft once a year and the product people all come and see all the cool stuff coming out of MSR. And, and some people from the game division looked at it and said, gee, I think we could use this. And, and so that led to um, conversations, which led to their first, um, first internal users. Um, There's one question from Sherrod. Uh, Sherrod, if you're there, can you ask the question? So, uh, uh, hi, hi, Phil. So hi, my sure. question was that in the context of, let's say, I, you're motivating actors from the context of IoT applications, but in IoT, we normally also model environment and the entities are sort of integrated inside a common shared sort of environment where they interact. So I'm just wondering if the actors only have message passing and there is no shared memory and there's no such, such stuff. How do you model then the environment? Um, they have to be turned into actors. And if you're going to use, if you're going to use it in this, in this way, or it's got to be a shared database. You know, I'm going to show you how to access shared shared databases. Um, so there but, is a concept uh, of uh, context sharing that can actually then happen in the context of actors. Well, yeah, but it has to be done through a data. It has to be done through an external database. It's not going to be okay. through shared memory. Got it. You know, That's fine. You know, that means it'll be cached and you're going to have to worry about um, cache consistency and all that. Okay. Um, so I looked at this, didn't have transactions and I said, gee, I think I can help. Um, I know something about how to integrate transactions into a framework like this. Um, and I hired an intern um, to help me get started on it. Um, and while I was doing this, Orleans got more traction. This big success story with Halo, which is the biggest game on Xbox at the time, um, attracted lots of other users. You know, they had a, you know, a, 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 a high profile customer, so that made other people interested. And um, by 2014, I was hooked. And this was the main thing I was doing and remained the main thing I was doing for almost five years. Um, the last major sub project that I did on Orleans was in 2019. Um, and I did it in parallel with ramping up on some other work. Um, I may get back to it at some point. It's not that I lost interest or ran out of things to do, but I've been doing it for a long time and thought it was time to maybe do something different. So um, the good news in all of this is that the vir virtual actor model automates scalability because you know if you add you can look you can add more um, add more servers and um, Orleans will simply spread the um, the new objects out on the new servers right because that's what it does every time you spin up a new object it finds a, a server on which to run it. Um, and if the load lightens up, eventually it can just start killing servers and um, it can even kill actors and they'll just resurrect the next time they're invoked because that's all automated as part of the platform. So scalability is um, something that the application developer can ignore, it happens automatically. And similarly, fault tolerance, as long as the actor saves state at the right times, um, the system will recognize when an object is running. And so, if if the server, let's suppose if server fails, take an extreme case, a server fails, um, obviously all the actors running on that server fail, you know, cannot be used. Um, so what happens? Well, the next time any of those actors are invoked, the runtime, the Orleans runtime says, oh, that object isn't running. And so it'll simply pick another server and it'll 
um, load the object on that server and start running it. Um, the fact that it had previously failed, I mean, the runtime doesn't know or care. Um, it just sees that it's not running. Um, now, obviously, if the object has state and you, it fails and then you're gonna bring it back on another server, it was up to the object to save its state so that if it failed, it would be resurrected in the right, in the right state. So state, saving state is up to the application developer. That is hard. And that's one of the problems that transactions helps with. But, but, um, but the, the um, you know, things like fault, failure detection, server failure, resurrecting objects, all of that is automated by the runtime. Phil, uh, there's one question from uh, Nalini. Nalini? Yeah. Hi, Phil. Um, so I have a question in terms of how Orleans uses the sort of the more pure version of the actor model, which has this concept of what we call acquaintances, which is how which actors can communicate with which other actors, which, um, you know, in, in the pure actor model, you can communicate acquaintances and messages, and that creates this dynamic communication topology of all these objects. I wonder whether um, you know, Orleans leverages those concepts in order to sort of improve, um, you know, support interaction as well as uh, manage the concurrency. Um, no, um, any object can talk to any other object as long as it knows its identity. Okay. So there's no, there's no, no nothing special. Um, there, there are no special communication paths here. Every object can talk to every other object. And how does an object discover other objects? Is it uh, given, communicated? Is there? Well, it's, I guess that's application programming. Um, uh, but um, usually the objects, the op every object has identity and its identity is generally comprehensible to the application. So, you know, games have game ID, player has player ID, um, mm -hmm. you know, device has device ID and so on. And so generally speaking, the application knows, you know, what object it's looking for that, um, you know, player, a player logs into a, um, the Halo game, they enter a lobby. Um, the lobby has no, I mean, the, the lobby is basically anonymous. I mean, there are all, there are many lob copies of the lobby. You, once you're in the lobby, um, the lobby object tries to um, find other people for you to play the game with. And um, you know, so it runs a matchmaking service. The matchmaking service knows the identity of all the players in the lobby. Um, it run, you know, it knows their profile. Given that they, given that it knows their identity, it knows their profile. It can now run an algorithm that tries to figure out which players are at the same skill level and ought, are good candidates to play the game with each other, you know, and so on. So you can kind of visualize how this might go. That the um, um, that the identity of the objects would, would unfold as the application needs them. Thank you. Um, but in all of this, the application is responsible for managing state. Orleans does not help you manage state. So the idea of saving state at the right time, reading it back, accessing it, that's all part of the application. Um, and over time, we've, we've improved that that situation, but at the time I got involved, that was that was where we are. Uh, that's where we were. And as soon as I looked at this, I said, boy, this is a great opportunity for database research. You're running stateful actors. You're not managing state. Like I said, I think I can help. Um, and and so we, over time, and this is not the first conce con conceptual view we had, but over time we realized that what we were basically building was an actor oriented database system where the actors were being stored, the actor states were being stored in a database and they needed to support all the usual abstractions that databases support. Indexing, indexes, transactions, queries, blah, 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 blah. And this is all the standard stuff you get in the, you know, when you learn about, when you learn about databases. Um, the, um, this actor oriented database now can use, um, any kind of database, any kind of storage. Um, and that's kind of weird um, that when you build a database system, normally the database system implements the storage system. And it's all, you know, it's wired all the way down to the disk drive. But, but here you're working with cloud storage, it can be anything. 
It can be a blob service. It can be a JSON service, a SQL service, could be anything. Um, now, if you're gonna have stateful objects, um, for those of you who have been around for a while, you might say, I have seen this somewhere before, um, at least in two places. One is back in the 80s um, and, and 90s, there was a, two lines of work that had stateful, act, stateful objects. One of them was persistent programming languages. Um, Argus comes to mind, there were, there were a number of them. Um, where, where the understanding was that um, you would tag some of your program state as being persistent. And, um, and then the programming language runtime would store this stuff out in storage somewhere. Um, and it would all be, all be transparent. Um, it's a little different than this one though, because first of all, it was not, it was not really an actor system. You know, they were multi-threading, I mean, they, they had all the, you know, there, there was a different, um, and, and they didn't really target this kind of application. I mean, they were looking at more classical database applications of, the, of that period. The other one is object-oriented databases. And the mo same story, I mean, they were building database systems where, where the, what was being manipulated was objects. And what the, um, the motivation there was computer-aided design um, that, um, they were, you know, literally, you know, electronic CAD um, where, where, where the, was the target. And there were a whole bunch of different um, startup companies that were off building these object-oriented databases. And they've almost all faded away by now, but um, that was um, just because the market never really developed to be as big as they had hoped. Um, so in some sense, here we go again, um, that um, you know, it's an object-oriented database, calling it an actor-oriented database, and, but with a different, um, a different motivation. You know, we're going after a different category of application, different kind of, of programming model. And it's hard um, because when you integrate with a programming system, you gotta be compatible with the, um, the program's um, abstractions, you know, the, this model for actor invocation and life cycle of an actor and threading and, and you know, the communication between the actors, exception handling, load balancing, caching. I mean, these are all part of the programming environment. And so when you integrate data management into it, you've got to do it in a way that there's not much of an impedance mismatch between what the database is, is offering and what the, the programming framework is offering. So we got a question. Right, I mean, in this architecture, are those actors uh, implemented inside database system uh, as different modules or is really a middleware layer? Sitting it's a middleware on top of layer. It's a middleware layer. You, it's a middleware layer, although it does lead to the question is, if the abstraction, if you're using a storage service that implements that abstraction, then how do you expose it without repeating it, you know, without duplicating it in the programming framework? You know, for example, if the, if the, if the storage system supports an indexing, as many of them do, then how do you expose that so that I can go in and get all the players who work in Irvine? You know, I mean, you know, you've got, you know, where player location is one of the attributes of player. And, you know, I can index it in the database, but I'm accessing it in the programming language. And so how do I link those up so that I'm not just repeating the same thing, but I've got to integrate it so that it's nicely exposed in the programming language. Um, okay, so um, just, Examples of all these, you know, you have a transaction like player X buys a kryptonite shield and pays with a gold coin. I mean, we actually do things like this in the games. Um, replication, maybe if you're playing a board game, which is, you know, slow moving game, you might want to have the, the state replicated in different regions of the world so that I can play chess with somebody in China, let's say. Um, that. Um, getting all the players in, in, a, in a particular city, if city is one of the attributes of player, um, maybe more elaborate queries, 
SQL-like queries over, over, um, over these actors. Um, there's a lot of streams. Wherever, wherever you have these interactive applications, there's always um, a lot of events flowing around. And so you want to monitor them. So stream processing, like one that we do is we monitor player behavior to look for cheaters by analyzing streams of behavior. Um, and um, maybe having a database view over these, these actor types is another, another possibility. Um, what may, there, there are several technical challenges that make this really different than other kinds of databases. The first is there's no server attached storage, which is really wild for a database person, you know, to be making, you know, supporting a database abstractions but you've got to go over the data center network to get to the data, which presumably is much slower than you're used to. It's not directly connected to the server. Um, moreover, um, it's going to be high latency. So it's not only disconnected, but it's high latency. On the other hand, it's also highly reliable. Those cloud storage services are replicated out the wazoo. And so you can really count on them to be there. Um, which is also different. Normally, you know, we worry very much about whether we have to mirror disks or replicate across servers. Un unnecessary, this, this cloud storage service is for all practical purposes, you know, um, you know failure proof. Um, third, it's got to work with any cloud storage system because everybody who builds an application using Orleans is going to have their own preference as to which you know, somebody wants to use SQL Server, somebody else wants to use Cassandra, the next one wants to use MongoDB or some key value, other key value store. And if we wire this tightly into one database system, we're really narrowing the market for this system a lot because when people come to build an application, they may already have, you know, we're a Cassandra shop. Our data is all in Cassandra. If you can't run on Cassandra, we can't use you. Um, you know, we're not going to you know start out with another database system in order to be able to use your programming environment. So it's essential this works on many different kinds of cloud storage systems. Um, this is unlike any other database problem I know of. I mean, you know, that um, to to make it so disconnected from the storage layer. Um, so what did we actually do? Well, we implemented, um, oh, I see we got another question here. Um, Chris? Yeah, Chris, go ahead. Uh, he's muted, he's muted. I unmute, I mean, let me try again. There Hi. Yeah, I think that worked. Okay. Yeah, I think it was mentioned, uh, actors uh, will be sort of load balanced round robin style across servers to handle this automatic uh, scaling, right? I'm curious how uh, latency handling of say actor access across all these nodes as you continue to scale with more actors and more nodes, how does that happen? And do you, do you leave it all up to application programming to handle things like interpolation? Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by interpolation, but, but the, the um, one, so, in general, it works well, um, is what we've found. But but um, certainly there are cases where you end up with objects that get chatty with each other and they're sitting on different servers and the latency of, of, of RPC communication between them becomes an issue. Um, and there's actually a very nice research paper they published about this, my colleagues, I was not involved in this part of the project, but they, they basically um, build a graph where they keep track of the amount of, of um, crosstalk between actors and migrate the actors um, in order to um, get the chatty ones co-located on the same server. Uh, that appeared in Eurosys um, a few years ago. It's, um, it's not widely used, it comes up, but it's, it's not, it, it doesn't seem to be a, a, real, a real pain. It's interesting, I would, you need, I, I, I'm, very sympathetic with the question. I think you know, it's when you see a system like this, you just expect that reducing the amount of crosstalk between actors would be an important optimization, but it seems not. I mean, it seems like most of the systems work fine. I guess communication is fast enough, um, but, um, but we do have technology to make it, to make it much better um, with, um, in, this, um, it's in the way that I just described. 
So, so um, what features do we want to add? Well, we added transactions, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. Um, geo distribution, so that um, you can have actors talking to each other in different data centers. We added secondary indexing, so you can do things like getting all players in Irvine. Um, but what I'm going to, I'm only have a limited time left. I'm going to focus just on, on transactions, just as an example, to take it down a level of detail. So um, the interface for writing transactions in Orleans is the same as in .NET or Java Enterprise Edition. And the way it works is that if you, um, when you define an actor, um, you tag methods um, with, um, with, if you want them to run as a transaction. So if you want the withdraw function on an account, to run as a transaction, you set the transaction option attribute to be required. Transaction is required. All right, and this goes back to the late 1990s and it's, it's become pretty much the universal way of, of doing this. Um, it actually came originally from my, a Microsoft project called Microsoft Transaction Server, introduced it in um, the late 90s and everybody's adopted it since then. Um, but there are big performance challenges in doing this in Orleans. The first is when you build transactions, the first thing you need is a log to keep track of all the updates and all the changes of transaction state from um, active to committed or aborted. But in the cloud, you, there is no log. I mean, I don't know, as far as I know, none of the cloud vendors offer log as a service to application developers. So you gotta do this yourself. Um, the second is the latency in accessing storage is going to be a problem because normally the way you implement these things is you, you set locks. And if you're going to run the transaction for too long, um, you're going to be holding the lock for a while. It's going to create contention. Um, the third is that objects migrate between servers. You know, if, the server, if, my, if an object is deactivated, when it's activated the next time, it might not be in the same server. So you can't cache state on that server. You've always got to go to, to um, the storage service to load it. And unlike, you know, most distributed transaction systems rely on the fact that most transactions are not distributed. You know, they, they, they can run distributed transactions, but you go to great pains to make sure that most of your transactions run locally on one machine because the distribution is so expensive. Here, all the transactions are gonna be distributed because the, the, the actors are spread out. You, know, you, you can't cl cluster them very easily. So um, the solution that we came up with is to use a speculative commit operation to hide the storage latency. I'm gonna show you how that works. Um, so, you execute a transaction, I think what you would regard as the obvious way. You've got a root object here on the right, um, and it, um, it starts calling the other objects, you know, remote procedure call to the other objects. It, it eventually, you, at, when it hits these objects, it, it sets locks on the objects that it accesses, standard two-phase locking, like any tra you know, standard transaction system. Um, and then at the end, the, um, when everything returns to the root object, the root object tries to commit. And that runs this two-phase commit protocol. Um, and generally in these systems, you have a transaction manager, a separate service that runs the two-phase commit protocol to make sure the transaction is atomic. By that, I mean that either all the objects um, commit the data um, permanently or none of them do. It's all or nothing. And in order to do this, the transaction manager has to have a log. It's got to keep track of its state somewhere. And since there is no server private storage, it has to do this in the cloud. So that log has got to be in some storage system somewhere in, in the data center. So let's see how this works. So this is you know, the standard way of running two-phase commits. So you got this transaction manager and you got these three objects that are part of the transaction. And then the transaction manager has storage nearby and in, in, in storage service, and then the objects have storage. So the way it starts is the, the, the transaction manager asks the objects to prepare. By that, it means it's gonna store its updates on disk somewhere in storage. And when it's all done, when it has an acknowledgement that it, the data is saved to storage, it's going to acknowledge that it's prepared. 
And this, when the transaction manager gets that acknowledgement from all of the objects, then it proceeds to tell them all to, to um, commit. So it commits locally. That's the operation that actually says the transaction is committed. From here on, you can't back out. It's got to be committed. And so it just goes off and it tells all the objects to commit. And so the object releases its lock now since it knows that its update is permanent and thereby makes it available to other transactions, logs its commit in its own storage and returns to, um, to, to the transaction manager. Now, the problem with this is you've got all this back and forth communications and two, whoops, and two communications with, um, with storage. And during that whole period, you're holding this lock. So that's a long time. That's, you know, 10, um, tenth a second, tenth of a second, many tenths of a second. You're going to get very low throughput on that piece of data because you're holding the lock for so long. So what we decided to do instead is to um, release the lock right away. When that request to prepare shows up at the object, the first thing the object does is it releases its lock before it does anything else. So there's, you don't accept, you don't, you, the locking is not gonna incur any of the delay um, of storage accesses. And then the rest proceeds as before. You log the update, you vote prepared. When all the updates, when all the objects agree to prepare, you're gonna log commit. And then you, you finish up. So why is this a bad thing? Well, the problem is that once you release the lock, other transactions now can jump in. Whoops. Other, I, other transactions can jump in and can start updating this object, even though it's not committed, right? Until, until it gets the commit message, it doesn't know whether the transaction is going to be committed because it could abort. I mean, there could be a crash. One of the other objects could have disappeared and not be willing to prepare. So once you release this lock, you're running a risk that if another transaction accesses or updates that object, you could end up updating, you could end up reading data that is actually going to be undone, that's going to actually be thrown out. And, and so in order to make that okay, um, you've got to take a you've got to take what's called a, a commit dependency. So let's walk through this now. I, I don't know any. I don't know how to do this in pictures. So, so the transaction, um, right, it sets a lock. When it receives the prepare, um, it releases the lock and starts its write, as I just showed you. And now we have the second transaction, and it comes in and it reads the object, object which in a normal database system would be disallowed. And what it does is it takes a commit dependency on T1. And what that means is T2 is not going to commit until that dependency is resolved, which means T1 has already been committed. So T2 finishes, it receives a prepare, it releases its lock. It can't do anything because T1 is still in flight. It's got to wait for T1 to finish. It can't do anything. But now that T2 released its lock, T3 can go jump in and it can update this object. And T4 can then update. You can have a whole bunch of transactions one after the other that can read and write this object um, and after it finishes its write, um, then all those updates can go out in a batch. And when it finishes that batch, then it update, then it can acknowledge, it can acknowledge the prepare and, and, and can go through the commit. So basically you're able to batch all of these updates to write them to storage at once. And you're also able to avoid this, this, um, uh, this contention. So um, anyway, we get huge performance improvements from this. Um, we wrote a paper about it. Paper was rejected, revised it, submitted it again, got rejected again. This is motivation for graduate students. So for those of you who know me, for my transaction work, even I get my transaction papers rejected. So it's, um, but we finally published it as a tech report and the paper remains unpublished. Um, it's still, we, we still haven't got a proper reviewed refereed publication describing the work. Um, and then a customer showed up 
Um, I don't have much time left, but let me just say that um, this was great. This is one of those success stories where somebody, we built it as a research project, somebody actually wanted it. Um, and they were basically gonna implement um, commerce inside a game. They wanted to be able to do things like buy a kryptonite shield with a gold bar. That was like literally what they wanted to do. And so um, they needed transactions to do it. But it turned out we had to redo the whole thing. Um, there were all kinds of problems. Um, we, we, we used inheritance in order to pick, in order to have actors pick up their um, transaction behavior. We had to use something else that they had replaced it with called dependency injection. Um, they didn't like the idea that a single object transaction had to go talk to this transaction manager. They didn't like the fact that there were all these transaction manager um, services around because that meant they had to deploy them in a separate cluster and, and keep track of all of that. Um, it was just, um, it was just too, too complicated for what they wanted. Um, and moreover, they thought that trans centralized transaction manager, even though we, we knew it was very high performance, we had carefully optimized it. They said, gee, you know, we don't like centralized anything in this system. It looks like it's gonna be too costly. It's gonna be a bottleneck. And so we had to go back and redo the whole thing. Um, and, and so we came up with um, single object transactions were able to resolve their dependencies locally. Um, we, have, we, we had a transaction manager embedded in each object. So there were no separate transaction managers. Um, and because the objects were geo distributed, you got geo distributed transactions out of this. So everybody was happy. It took about a year to redo all of this. And in the course of that, we realized that there were some performance issues that we could get past by um, doing operation logging. We, and we actually have a, um, another version of this system that was done as a research project, again, unpublished. And also it's not in the product, it's sitting on a shelf waiting for some other internal user um, to need it. Um, so I'm out of time. Let me, um, I'm gonna skip to the end here. I just, I have another whole section on geo distribution. I, I knew there was very little chance I was gonna get to it, but um, I, I kept it around just in case. Um, so we have a bunch of other projects that we that we did um, that um, hash indexes, stream processing, primary copy replication, and plenty more that we could do. That these are, if I get back to Orleans again, these are things I might do in the future. But um, it's it's been a lot of it's been a lot of fun, um, and um, the um, hash indexes were published in Cider. The um, geo distribution was published at. Um, Uppsala in 20, 2017. Um, but in summary, created a model here for database system research to show you where these problems come from and explained how this Orleans um, work fit into that. Talked about the virtual actor model, distributed transactions. I didn't get time to talk about geo distribution. And let me just close with, um, keep this up on the screen um, with references. This is. There's a lot available on the on the web. The um, Orleans is one of the most active open source projects out of Microsoft. It's after .NET and the um, um, and the um, C# -sharp compiler, the Rosalind compiler. Um, it's it's probably the most active um, open source project at Microsoft. Um, and um, lots of people have contributed to the work I've I've described here. Many of them are students in other places, maybe about half of them are at Microsoft. Um, and I'll leave this up. I don't know, I'm happy to, I know we're past time, but if people have additional questions, Shara, do you wanna, wanna say something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shara has a, yeah, go ahead. So Phil, yeah, I, that, that idea of early rock release is pretty cute. Uh, so I'm not, just to, uh, this thing, I'm not the one who reviewed or rejected, <laughs> just to be sure. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I had a question about that. So a while ago, we had tried something similar. We called it O2PC protocol. And but in, only in the context of primary backup systems. And the complexity we ran into is that when you had multiple logs, this gets a lot, lot harder. 
I wonder how you address that aspect. So for a single log, this is relatively straightforward, I think, right? But if you have multiple logs, uh, the commit dependency tracing can be pretty complicated. And uh, so I was just wondering, do you deal with that aspect or is there a single log implementation of it? No, I mean, you, you, you know, you have, you have to face that. I mean, you have to keep track of the dependence. You have to log the dependencies. Um, and in the event of a failure, when you recover, um, when a transaction, you know, let, let's suppose an object fails, an actor fails, um, it recovers. Um, the, in, the new, in the current system, each, op, each actor has its own log. So when it recovers, that's, the log is part of its state. And if it, um, if it had a prepared transaction, um, then its list of dependencies are in the log. Um, along with the identity of the transactions it depends on. And for each of those transactions, it knows the identity of the root object for that transaction, um, which um, you know, was, was part, of the, part of the dependency information. And so it simply invokes that object, that invokes that actor to find out what the resolution was. Um, you, and because the nature of Orleans is, you know, if you, if you know the identity of the actor you're asking to answer your state question, you know, committed or aborted, um, it'll just spin up the object if it isn't running and you can immediately get an answer. So it, it turned out not to be that. I mean, it's, it's, yes, it's recovery is where all the complexity is in two phase commit. And so, yeah, we had to, we had to do that with distributed logs. So, so if I can do a quick follow up on that one, right? So, so imagine that there's one transaction which has become or one object whose state is not decided yet, right? And there's a commit dependency. So it's released its logs, it's waiting. So there's a commit dependency that forms. So there's a whole cascade of stuff that's happened, right? Now the question is, if at this stage, my, my commitment depends on your commitment, right? But the, let's say the, site running or the op where the object was, that particular server fails. So I don't know if you committed or aborted at that stage. So now I, the, the, I'll have to make some kind of a decision whether I abort myself or I sort of continue waiting forever. So there has to be some decision on this. So I, I would assume that you're sort of then tracking it down and aborting the whole chain of things. Is that, um, is that correct? It's not correct. Yes, but it won't happen in Orleans because um, as, long as, as long as cloud storage is 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 available oh, and the object that you invoke to find out the state of the transaction will be able to answer the question of what is this what you know did it commit or not i see i got it okay you know, this is we don't, you know normally case. yeah normally you've got this blocking problem in distributed transactions yeah. where if the server fails and it is the only place that the state of that transaction is stored you're screwed you know, yeah. you, you simply have to wait, but that's just not going to happen. And one of the benefits of having this highly reliable cloud storage system is it solves the problem for you. Nice, nice. Yeah, no, and I, that makes sense. Okay, we have uh, time for uh, at most two more, uh, two, two more questions. Nalini, you want to go next? Oh, all right. <laughs> so, uh, Phil, does Orlean support some form of distributed garbage collection for the actors? Because I would oh. think that with all the replication and migration, you would probably have actors that need to be garbage collected, right? Um, yeah, so it's actually local to the, the, gar the, um, the deactivation of objects um, happens at each server. Um, so it's just based on um, lack of activity. They have a timer and if the, op if the actor is, is, um, has not been, um, has 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 not has not been active has not processed any messages within some period of time then um, it's it's removed from the list of the, the table of actors at that point there are no links to the object and so the .NET garbage collector will pick it up there's no remote links to the object either uh, there may be, but those links, you know, the, those those references are all to the object's identity, and so they, you know, that that you, it, mm -hmm. it's it's not a hard it's not a hard link. It's a you know it's a it's a um, logical link, and so if the act if the actor on the other server um, 
calls that object and it's not running, you, you know, the Orleans runtime will load it and run it. I see. So it's in some sense, garbage collection means that it's persisted and can be reactivated if needed. Yeah, basically, you should, way to think about it is that all the objects of a given class always exist. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> and they, they, they can't, cloud storage, I guess. Yeah, they're not created or destroyed. They always exist. They can always be invoked. Um, it's just they might not be active. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Well, in the interest of time, uh, we we can stop this uh, webinar here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Phil, for your for the wonderful talk. Yeah, we re you're welcome. resume our meeting in the afternoon. Yep, yep. I'll see many of you. Um, we later can do this. Uh, yeah, virtual uh, uh, class. <laughs>